1979, the Supersonics of Seattle captured its first and its last National Basketball Association championship. Nearly 30 years later, the team was packing up and leaving the idyllic Pacific Northwest for the often forgotten about Great Plains of Oklahoma and its capital city. But as it goes, one's trash is another's treasure. The new team, that quite obviously renamed itself the Thunder, gave the good folks in Tornado Alley, which quietly neighbors America's heartland, something meaningful to root for as the only pro team in any sport in the state of Oklahoma. Because until then, the city we now call OKC, thanks to the team, was perhaps best known for the 1995 bombing. At the time, one of the worst acts of domestic terrorism in United States history. Well, since then, we can't seem to go a day without someone figuratively saying, hold my beer to that. We've had too many attacks on our democracy to even count, almost invariably acted out by the group that has continuously proven to be our nation's greatest threat. Those that generally make, enforce, and control all the rules, yet live in constant fear that the thing he stole will soon be stolen from him. So the goal? To make it great. Again? This, the fact that the beautiful, scenically underrated U.S. town is only known for an underachieving basketball team and a bombing, has always bothered Juliette Danois. The only child of the Oklahoma City Danois, a family of teachers who, themselves, were beneficiaries, or victims, depending on which way you look at it, of Brown versus the Board of Education. Juliet was born and raised in the brave nation. Maybe it was the activism, all the marches and sit-ins that provided them with this sense and ability and need to impart wisdom. In fact, Jack Danois played an integral role in the Black Panther Party's initiatives to feed and educate his community. It was during one of those missions where he met Mary, a student at Langston University just outside the city, who he later married. Juliet was born a year after Mary graduated. Some said it was their respective, natural way with words, ability to encode in a way that was both calming and easily digestible. But everybody who bared the Danois name was an educator on some level. Needless to say, education was heavily emphasized in their household, and young Juliet always managed to exceed expectation. She was bright, as Southern folk would say, which made her different. Despite making both the cheerleading team and the chess team in high school, she always found it hard to connect with people, never put together enough to earn the respect of the girls, never confident enough to attract the eye of the guys. She did, however, manage to get the attention of some of the country's finest post-secondary institutions. And although she loved her hometown, like most ambitious people, what Juliet wanted, she figured, resided somewhere other than where she was. And so, she had to go. First West for undergrad at Stanford, then East to achieve postgraduate status at Harvard. By age 35, she had been all over the world, was fluent in four languages, and had had experiences that very few people, regardless of class, would ever have. But, as the trope that continues to follow the women's liberation movement goes, she was still single. The crazy thing is that she was perfectly okay with this as she was enjoying her freedom the first 34 years of her life. But because she did want a family of her own someday, it was something about the way those words, geriatric pregnancy, sounded that put the literal fear of God in her because someday probably needed to be today. At age 44 now, her body is still smoking hot, though 
Her eggs have long since been frozen, and she's become about as fluent at swiping left and right as she has at speaking Mandarin, her second language. But what Juliet truly wants is what she believes her parents have, someone who's her equal who she can both learn from and grow with as they age. But after recalling the exactly 51 trysts she's had with men all over the world of various lengths and levels of seriousness, not counting the one and a half experiences with women as she tried to be open-minded about what form in which her mate might exist, she was fighting the natural urge to let cynicism set in. There was this silly thought that maybe they used to make men a certain way, a better way, and that today's man just didn't fit the bill. But again, that was silly. There were many, many, many factors as to why she, like many women, couldn't, or hadn't yet, found a suitable mate, none of which she gave a single ounce of a fuck about. In a matter of days, she will accept a new job in a new city, which will once again put her in a whole new tax bracket. But, little does she know, this new move will actually make it even harder for her to fulfill her dream of marriage, and thus a family. Because although this new town offers some of the amenities she prefers, like highly educated people, diverse residents, a great history full of tourist attractions and a plethora of parks and things to do outdoors, men, unfortunately, are not one of those amenities. So on the dating front for our dear Juliet, things are about to get a hell of a lot worse before they get better. I'm Kayana Ebony Brown, and this is a story of music and men. I have big dreams for my little company to be great someday. But not just dreams, actual plans to get it there. And I know what you're thinking. Another typical millennial girl, all career, no love life. And well, you're right. <laughs> but you know what? It's not my fault. Seriously, I have the perfect explanation for why, unfortunately, my plans for success in business don't actually translate to dating. Here's the thing that most people don't know. Our nation's capital has the lowest marriage rate in the country, but the highest number of same-sex couples. That means DC could literally be the gayest place in America. I mean, in order to find love, a single girl might have better luck finding, well, a single girl. But for those of us who prefer our mates be from Mars, shit, we might have to start going there to find them. Because when it comes to the game of love, the most powerful city on Earth is a forlorn underdog. All of this makes great fodder for my often self-indulgent social media rants where I chronicle my life's two greatest hurdles music, and men. It makes for even better lunch conversation, especially when the players are my closest friends. Now look, I must warn you before I introduce them that you will probably have never met two more contrasting figures before in all your life. Even my divorced parents weren't as opposing in personality as these two, although somehow Ty and Jay managed to remain rather close and relatively civil. Perhaps it was because they never had to live together. That usually helps. Today's lunch takes place at our favorite mutually agreeable place to both eat and take in the view of DC's array of similar hipster artsy folk, busboys and poets. Now busboys is a restaurant slash coffee shop slash bookstore 
aptly named after Langston Hughes, who, before his acclaim as one of the great American poets, worked as a busboy at the Wardman Park Hotel. It's the kind of spot where you'll find people who care whether their coffee is fair trade and their food is organic, sustainable, hormone-free, and, of course, locally sourced. Really, I haven't completely given up. I just, I don't know. Ty tried to explain, searching for the words as if they were somewhere in that plate of salad on the table in front of her. I just changed my perspective a bit, I guess. The subject was the non-date dinner she'd had last night with a guy from the building where she worked. Things had gone nicely. Not bad. Not great. Just nice. But not nice enough to do it again. Like I explained, D.C. is a different place when it comes to finding love. And like the very liberal town that it is, said difficulty does not discriminate based on race, religion, creed, and despite the statistic, sexuality either. Cisgender heterosexual women, however, was the group I could confidently speak for. It was bleak. There are victims, a category under which I'd file my friend Ty. Full name. Talia Elise Aldridge. Age, 30. Birthplace, Lagos, Nigeria, but also calls Naples, Florida her home since she did grow up there. Now, Ty's got one of those faces that makes you feel special when you're around her. It's her natural attentiveness coupled with her bright, cheerful eyes that appear as if they're smiling at you even when she's not. They sit on a round face with cheekbones that are almost artistically high, covered by brown sugar-colored skin. The kind of brown that's golden in the right kind of light. She's the epitome of an American girl, down to her origins being in another country. She's the youngest of her parents' four children, and the only girl. And I've joked with her on many occasions about whether she's an actual princess. Yes, it is her father's nickname for her, but, you know... I have reason to believe he means it literally when he refers to her that way. And, perhaps in jest, she has never formally denied my allegations, only acknowledged my inquiry with a snicker that makes me feel silly for even asking, yet still curious. Nevertheless, she gives off an aristocratic vibe that could come across intimidatingly if she wasn't so southernly gleeful. Despite her very traditional and conservative upbringing, she keeps an open mind, and she's the most loving person I know, which makes it easy to talk to her about anything because she tries her best not to judge, but rather to understand. Armed with an Ivy League education from Princeton, she was now a postdoctoral fellow so her chosen profession as a psychologist was a perfect fit for this natural skill set. So what made her a victim? Well, she met a guy just out of undergrad, dated him for a few years and said yes to his proposal while in med school. I was a bridesmaid at their beautiful midsummer night ceremony in Rock Creek Park. Now, nearly three years to the day, she was reclaiming her maiden name before she was able to add the title doctor. She just signed next to the X at the bottom of the divorce papers. She was serving him. Even with all that's going on, I can't bring myself to give up. Jesus, would you stop staring at my hair? I'd been caught. I had just seen her the day before when her hair was normal. At least normal to how I was used to seeing her. But now, gone. All of it. Except for about a half inch or so. I couldn't help but stare. So I said, but it's gone, like all of it. My observation went ignored. My point is, she went on, the statistics just aren't in our favor. Hmm, I beg to differ. Jay disagreed, of course, sitting behind a burger and some fries, but concentrating on those fries though. Now, Jay was one who never had a problem finding something new to do on a weekend. In fact, she routinely met good-looking, successful, available men with whom she shared a common interest. Of course, the most common of interests, almost always being sex. 
Jay would be in the category perpetrators. Full name, Hesinia Lorena Loriano. Age, 28. Birthplace, Chicago, Illinois. Now, you have to admit, some women just have it. And Jay, well, she's one of those women. She isn't just pretty, she's actually striking. And she's the kind of girl who walks into every room as if she owns it and everyone in it. Head up, shoulders back, and a strut that actually might rival Naomi Campbell's. Whether it's true or not, she knows that every man wants her and that every woman, well, this is D.C., so there are plenty of women out there who want her too. She's slightly taller than average by about an inch. She has soft, curly hair, which always varied in style. Lately, she kept it on the shorter side. She's a slightly darker version of her mother, an El Salvadorian immigrant who found love in a terribly hopeless place when she fell for a married dentist whose office she briefly worked for during that time. Stereotypes, even those of a positive nature, are still stereotypes. So, I won't say that all products of Howard University habitually enforce the advice, dress like you have the job you want, but Jay, who graduated top of her class from the story university, is certainly one of them. Fashion and style comes effortlessly for her, and she's always very put together. Although Ty's always been more of the textbook big sister type, I actually kind of looked up to Jay a little more. I mean, I've always admired Ty, but though I've never said this out loud, I've always been a bit enamored by Jay. Perhaps part of me wishes that I were more like Jay in some ways. Perfect example, Jay explained. This guy I met the other day. At Trader Joe's, Ty exclaimed, cutting her off to explain this apparent absurdity to me. She doesn't even cook. She uses the grocery store as her own personal meat market. Jay carried on without a hitch. 32 years old, single professor from St. Louis. Georgetown University brought in him and five more just like him to fill a void in their liberal arts department. We're hooking up tomorrow night. Seriously, is that all it's about? Ty asked, although I had a sneaking suspicion she already knew the answer. My point is, men are coming and going all the time. And perhaps to amuse Ty, Jay continued with, I just like to meet the ones coming so I can come with them. Ty snuck in a sigh, head shake, and eye roll all in one gesture before. I can literally feel your eyes on my head, she said to me. Look, I'm gonna be honest with you. I've been checking for a motherfucking dragon tattoo for the last 10 minutes myself. With another roll of the eyes, Ty said, Jesus, it's just hair. It's not like I cut off an arm, which started a back and forth between them. Yeah, but it was your hair. But I'm not my hair. No, but it was kind of you. <laughs> well, it's gone now, okay? With a laugh Jeez. that kept her position in the debate light and playful, rather than defensive. And in the same breath as Ty peered over Jay's shoulder, squinting as she apparently recognized the tall, pantsuit-clad woman talking to the hostess at the front of the restaurant, she revealed, I know that lady, seemingly already reminiscing as she continued eyeing the woman who was likely waiting for a table to open up. She then proceeded to tell us who she was, her former college advisor, who was the one who recognized her listening skills, uncanny empathy, and knack for asking all the right questions and encouraged her to pursue a career in psychology. As she finished filling us in, the woman, who was following the hostess by this time, was coming right toward us. When she was close enough, they caught eyes as they both began smiling at this unexpected encounter. Professor Danois, she then stood up and accepted a handshake from the woman well before one was even offered. Talia, wow. It's so good to see you. And please, it's, it's Juliet. We're not on campus anymore. As they shared a similar laugh, which seemed to start and stop on the same note. I'm sorry, Professor Dent, Juliet. These are my friends, Kenya and Jay. How do you do? She asked, likely rhetorically, as she softly, almost daintily, took each of our hands one by one for a shake. Before either of us could offer greetings of our own to her, Ty went on. Professor Danois was the reason I enjoyed my time at Princeton so much. And then she looked at Juliet and asked, what brings you here to DC? Well, and she paused, 
to control a smile that was trying its best to creep its way onto her lips. I just accepted a position as the Dean of Prince Hall University School of Medicine. Ty's eyes became as big as saucers as she controlled herself from shouting, Oh my goodness, congratulations! Juliet tried again to contain her blush, even though she knew that this was a very big deal. Again, she failed as she smiled and thanked Ty. Prince Hall University is a private institution founded in 1850. Its primary campus is located in the lively Adams Morgan neighborhood of D.C. on roughly 187 acres. And today, it has a total undergraduate enrollment of just under 4,500. Prince Hall University's ranking in U.S. News of Best Colleges generally ranges between 10 and 13, somewhere between Duke and Dartmouth on the National University's list as it should, considering the pretty high academic standards, its robust alumni list, and its multi-billion dollar endowment. You can think of PHU as the NYU of DC. It's well-versed at many concentrations with its business, law, and performing arts schools bearing the brunt of the weight for its impeccable reputation. I know a lot about this school because, (sighs) let's just say, I have somewhat of a history with it but we'll get into those details a little later. Why have we not connected on Facebook, she asked Ty. I'm not on Facebook, Ty said, almost embarrassed by her deliberate decision not to put up with the time suck of social media, as she called it. For the record, it wasn't like she'd left Facebook. She'd never even joined it. Hmm. I thought everyone your age was on Facebook. We were in 2012. Jay said, only loud enough for me to hear her. Juliet then reached into her clutch and whipped out a card, pointing it at Ty as she said, My cell number's on there. Let's meet for lunch. Smiling, Ty agreed that she'd text her within the week, as they shared a little more small talk about life in D.C. Well, uh, I'm supposed to be meeting someone. She looked around to see if maybe she could spot them, her eyes landing on a white guy of average height and even more average looks, wearing jeans and a blazer. Juliet smiled at him before leaning in to be more discreet. No offense, she said, looking at me and Jay, but mutual friends aren't always the best people to arrange your love life. She was talking more to Ty at this point. But this is a big city. I guess I'll have more luck later. The three of us looked at each other because little did she know the size of this city was quite misleading. When you calculated the number of residents plus the people in surrounding Maryland and Virginia multiplied by the people coming in and going out on a daily basis divided by the square mileage, still, the numbers just didn't add up. She turned and greeted the man as they took seats at a table a few feet away from us. Hey, is it weird that I don't even think about dating that much? I asked out of nowhere as Ty retook her place with us. And this was perhaps the one thing they both could agree on. Yes. Yes. Now, I have no clear-cut category in which to place myself. I'm not a victim, certainly not a perpetrator. In fact, I might be too green to play any position in the game at this point. Full name? Kenya Amani Shaw. Age? 27. Birthplace? Washington, D.C. I'm just a girl who hasn't been on consecutive dates since diving headfirst into my dream of owning a record label. Four years ago. Now consider this. A girl uninterested in the things that interest the rest of the world, but is obsessive about her own interests, which are not typical interests of a girl. Expressing those interests with an unmoved, undeterred passion, she's usually called a nerd. Now, if her interest goes a step further by moving into competitive male-driven industries, she is then aptly referred to as a tomboy. And to take it even further, if these interests of hers are then pursued passionately and in competitive male-dominated domains with a level of assertiveness that says to everyone that she is in it to win it, well, she's then thought of as probably a lesbian. (laughs) I've been called it all. Nerd, tomboy, lesbo, And I accept this compliment. 
because I might actually be a nerd. What the fuck is a tomboy anyway, really? And some of the most powerful, most interesting, most successful women I know are, in fact, lesbians. So if I'm thought of as part of their group, thank you. That, I suppose, is the plight of the modern woman. She's got to be all figured out by the world or risk being labeled or mislabeled. What you need to know about me, though, is simple. I love music. I have a penchant for creative and administrative details. And I like to win. My approach to this life as a future music mogul is like that of an athlete on the road to greatness. I show up early. I stay up late. I study game film, which is to say I like to stay sharp. And usually my main advantage over my competition is my willingness to outwork them. So, I ask you again, is it weird that I don't even think about dating like that? Jay and Ty both thought, yeah. <laughs> and as they laughed, not at me, but at their first agreed upon opinion ever, I refused to join them as I dropped my head in playful shame. And then I attempted to explain something to the two people who knew me best in this world, which meant they already knew this. Look, it's not that I don't think about men, I do. It's just, I don't really know what to say to the ones I want to meet, and it's really never the ones you want who approach. That is so true. Which is why I go after what I want, Jay said, not revealing anything new. Don't leave it to them, shit, it's 2000 and oh, that requires way too much transparency. I used the word transparency instead of the word I should have used, which was confidence. Jay had the confidence. I didn't. Plus, I didn't even know where to start. Well, you can't start it in your father's basement, that's for sure. Hey, why don't you come with us? I'm taking Ty with me to this networking thing. Jay proceeded to describe this upcoming event that she thought I should attend, although I already knew I wouldn't be joining them. As a writer, Jay's main outlet was Face, one of the country's top female-focused lifestyle magazines, often referred to as the Lady GQ. So if there was a place with even the slightest hint of eligible bachelors, Jay was sure to be on top of it. Pun very much intended. <sighs> yeah, I don't know why I'm letting her talk me into going to this thing. Because she needs to get her mind off this divorce paper signing shit and have some goddamn fun. You should come too. Yes, you should. <sighs> Misery sure does love company, doesn't it? And before I could respond, she said, And don't say, I can't. Look, I have artists that have dreams, and they look to me to make plans for those dreams to come true. That means I got work to do. Reminds me, Wisconsin. I had forgotten to put this upcoming meeting in my phone calendar, so I was doing it now. The fuck is in Wisconsin? Jay asked, with seemingly half that burger in her mouth. Not the state. Wisconsin Avenue in Georgetown. I have to meet a guy there about getting Lucas on this 930 Club card. Jesus, you're still trying to get Lucas on that stage? They had heard all my war stories about this. Three times previously, I had met managers or booking agents whose artists were doing shows there and asked if we could join them. All three times, the answer was no. Of course, they didn't know me, so with one in every two people calling themselves a musician, if there were any openings, they'd likely just give that opportunity to someone they knew. And now... The perfect person for my artist to open for was coming to town in two and a half days. I had information that would make my plea a slam dunk to get my artist on that card. But I still had no clue who to even talk to. So when Ty asked if I was still trying, I replied, yes, I'm still trying. And preferably, I'd like to do it and get a check. When my artists get paid, I get paid. And I need to get paid. Shit, you need to get laid. <laughs> and for the second time at my expense, they shared a laugh. You know what? I'll, I'll admit, Jay was probably right. But she did not deserve the satisfaction of knowing that. Thank you. 
This episode of Of Music and Men was written and produced by me, Kayana, with express permission and the help of some of the most incredible indie artists in the world. For information on these artists and how you can support their efforts, visit the show notes in your podcast app or go to ofmusicandmen.com slash podcast and select this episode. All right, first we started out with Alone by Mike Leche. And then we have music from Filmstro arranged for this episode by me. Then we have Ready, Set, Swing by Michael Nicholas. Then back-to-back tracks by Khalil Ismael. First, Sometimes, and then Words. And then we had something a little different. An improvised jazz guitar riff by Valentin Sosnitsky. And then another Filmstro musical arrangement. And lastly, this track, Self Driving by Sro, an incredible producer out of West Virginia. And of course, all of our promotional music is done by Khalil Ismael. For information on these artists and how you can support their efforts, visit the show notes in your podcast app or go to ofmusicandmen.com slash podcast and select this episode. And if you would like to have your music featured on the show, check out our website for more information on how you can submit. Now remember, Of Music and Men is so much more than just this podcast. The novella series is available in online bookstores, and if you wish to have a physical copy, you can get it on our website. Of course, that's ofmusicandmen.com, where you can also get t-shirts and all other kinds of cool merch. Don't forget to subscribe at Apple, Stitcher, or wherever it is you're listening to this podcast. And remember to review and give us a five-star rating. Lastly, connect with us on Patreon where you can become a part of this project and its journey and help it to grow to everything it was meant to be. Make sure to share this some way, somehow, with at least one friend. And follow Of Music and Men everywhere online at Of Music and Men. And when you do, please... Don't hesitate to reach out. Artists and entrepreneurs are a very unique type. We face lots of rejection, almost too often for comfort. So whether you're a seasoned business owner or creator, aspiring to be one, or you're simply here to hear a great story, You know, I want to always leave you with something to ponder until next time. Today's words are from Charles C. Noble. You must have long-range goals to keep from being frustrated by short-range failures. (laughs) Now, I know a lot about this. This project, in fact, is one of my long-range goals. And yes, it was or has been peppered with a bunch of short-range failures. But as you can see, the long-range goals always, always take precedence. What are your long-range goals? Next time on Of Music and Men. After lunch at Busboys earlier that afternoon with the girls... I left with Jay's words stuck in my head. You need to get laid. See, the truth is that my line of work puts me in direct contact with all kinds of men all the time. Granted, they're mostly rappers, singers, and wannabe rockers. Hence, the reason why I almost never have second dates. And then there were guys like him. The reason for my lack of first dates. Now the him I'm referring to was the owner of two of the most beautiful brown eyes I have ever seen in all my life. Which I found myself staring into as he helped me to retrieve the mess that had fallen out of my bag and onto the floor of the high-end electronic store showroom. Now, after leaving Jay and Ty earlier, I hopped on the metro and headed all the way across town in the direction of my afternoon meeting. But instead, I found myself loitering inside the tech superstore before I suddenly and mindlessly collided with a so-called genius running by, spilling my entire bag onto the floor. 
The smarty pants didn't even stop to help me gather my things. Now, the aforementioned him with the deep brown eyes, the skin like Godiva, and the beard. And look, I, I have a thing for beards. And the curly faded haircut was a customer just waiting to be waited on. I hadn't even noticed him until he was already down on the floor in front of me, helping to collect the CDs and other mess that had fallen out of my bag. Now this could have been it, my chance to be transparent. That thing I said to Jay at lunch earlier, talking to guys required too much of. But it was as if all of the possible words I could have said had fallen onto the floor too. And I was having trouble picking them up as well. It felt like an eternity down there with him on the floor, blanketed by silence. I kept wanting to find those beautiful brown eyes of his again, but I forced myself to focus on the floor in front of me, because, of course, that was important, right? After the five seconds or so that it took, I stood up first, and he followed, handing me one last disc. I realized right then that I must have also spilt my breath out onto the floor too when I dropped my things because my lungs were empty. But I somehow managed to graciously mumble, thanks, thank you. And as usual in situations like this, I had no idea what to do, what to say or what to do with my hands. I clumsily leaned onto a tablet or something, causing it to make a noise which then caused even more anxiety as he smiled and gave a quiet, you're welcome, just as a saleswoman approached saying that she could help him. I stood there and I watched. I watched him walk away, still wanting to say something, but only wishing that I already had. I even started to come up with little scenarios in my head like, what if I waited outside until he was finished and accidentally, but of course not so accidentally, bumped into him again. Only this time I would- I'm all done, you ready? 